Well, thank you so much. I, you see that I, I absolutely, categorically love your pastor. And uh, he is an absolute gem. And it's great to be here with you. I want to shout out to 515. And I understand they're uh, also watching up in Washington, D.C. And uh, it is just a joy to be here, to be here with you. Uh, what is special is to have my bride with me today, uh, Karen. Um, in, a, in a few months, we'll celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. And she is... Uh, She's, uh, she's the best part of this deal right here. Um, I met her in college. I had broken up with my high school sweetheart. Well, the truth of the matter is she broke up with me. Um, this is uh, the summer between my freshman and sophomore year in college, just before I went back on campus for that semester. Uh, girlfriend kicked me to the curb. And um, can you imagine somebody getting rid of all of this? <laughs> yeah, you say absolutely. And uh, so... I was in my dorm room praying. I went to a Christian college, and, I, and I, this is a true story. I said, God, no more women. They mess you up every time. I'm going to be single-minded, and you and me, Jesus, stay focused and just, you know, not to be distracted, detracted, or deterred in any way whatsoever. I'm just going to do this. Well, people who know me know once my mind is made up, I can be fairly focused. And I got up off my knees, walked down the street, uh, toward the main administration building, my heart and mind filled with this deep-seated stalwart prayer not to be distracted or deterred, stay focused on Jesus, and walked up the stairs, and there in the lobby was this beautiful, new, young lady on campus, and for I got healed instantly. <laughs> it just, I don't know what happened. The burdens just left me, and uh, my mama taught me to be hospitable to strangers, and so I introduced myself and said, you're new on campus, and I'm your tour guide. And I've uh, been showing her around now for 50 years, so she is a, she's the absolute, absolute joy. Well, I've got a long ways to go in a short time to get there. There's something heavy in my heart that I want to share, but would you bow your heads with me for a word of prayer? Holy Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy in our lives. You have been good to us. You have been lavishly good to us. And Lord God, I pray in the name of your son that you'll speak to our hearts. I'm acutely aware of the fact that nobody needs to hear anything that Crawford Loritz has to say, but we can't make it without a word from God. So Spirit of the living God, make your word alive in our hearts and minds. Push back the distractions. Lord, give us the ability to concentrate and focus. Rain in those scud missile thoughts that we have and help us to stay in the moment, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What do you do when the wind is knocked out of you? This has been a challenging year, and I'm sure we've heard all about all the ups and downs, and we've experienced uh, devastation, and a part of what Pastor Louis shared a few moments ago. Uh, but what do you do when the wind is knocked out of you? What do you do when you're discouraged? What do you do when you get that text message, or that email, or that voicemail, and it's, oh boy, Oh boy, you weren't expecting it. This is the reason why arrogance and pride is so ludicrously ridiculous. When you stop to think about it, pride is stupid. Because the truth of the matter is we control categorically absolutely nothing. We're one text message away from devastation. So what do we do? How do, we, how do we not be branded by discouragement? And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about wind in our sails. How do I not be branded by the south side of life? How do I not be branded by the bad stuff that happens to all of us? What, what, what do I do? What do I do? You know, I want to distinguish or between three words here that sometimes we, we use interchangeably, but they're actually very different. Disappointment, discouragement, and depression. Uh, disappointment is what it is. You, don't, you can be disappointed, but not necessarily discouraged. Every day we get disappointed. Disappointment just simply means an expectation has not been met, right? 
uh, somebody didn't show up on time, they didn't return the phone call on time, or whatever. Uh, it's just a garden variety of the unanticipated in life, and, and our expectations were not met. Uh, let me jump over discouragement to depression. Depression, uh, this is a little bit above my pay grade here. I'm not a clinical psychologist or any, that kind of thing, but depression means that you've gone beneath the hope line. Uh, there's circumstantial depression, there's clinical depression, and I won't say much more because I'll get into trouble, but it does mean that you have lost hope. And you're down in this dark, downward spiral. It can be anger turned inward. And I, I, I would say that if any of us struggle with depression, I would encourage all of us to get some help. We need objectivity. We need people speaking into our hearts and lives. But in between those things is the word, is, is the whole idea of discouragement. Discouragement does not necessarily mean that you're depressed, but it means a lot more than you're disappointed. It means that you've taken a gut punch. It means that you've, you've, you've read something, you've seen something, or something has happened that just knocked the wind out of you. You can go on, but you feel like you're dragging anchor. Uh, you don't have much joy. And the question I want to I, I wanna raise again, I said it earlier, how do we not be branded by discouragement? The truth of the matter is all of us are going to get discouraged. All of us are going to feel the punch. But how do, I not, how do I not be branded by that? You have met people, and so have I, that they're just tainted with the negative. And the reason why they're tainted with the negative is self-protection. And so they feel like if I slash my expectations and if I just kind of, you know, not, 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 not dream too much, I can protect me. Well, that's a terrible way to live. How do I not be branded by discouragement? Now, I want to say something here that is, that is counter to what our culture is all about today um, because this runs counter to everything that we see and think and read these days. Our problem in our culture today is that we think with our feelings. So what I'm about ready to say to you just runs against everything. But what I've discovered in all my years of walking with the Lord and managing my own times of uh, emotional funk and discouragement, now listen to this. It is the choices, hear me on this, it is the choices and decisions that I make when the wind is knocked out of me that will determine the trajectory of my emotional attitude and my outlook. It's the decisions that you make. The decisions, hear me on this, it's the decisions that you make. Parenthetically, listen to me, listen to me. Your emotions, they're great passengers, but they're horrible drivers. And I'm not saying to deny our feelings or to deny our emotions, but what I'm saying is that the banks of the river, when it comes to your emotions, on one bank is your mind that you're thinking, and on the other bank is your volition or your will. And they need to guide the emotions. If not, you'll be one swamp, controlled by that. So what choices and decisions do we need to make when discouragement comes knocking on our door, the wind is knocked out of our sails, I get this email that is horrible or this phone call, what are the decisions that we need to make? Now, I want to suggest that there are five core decisions. Now, again, whenever preachers preach and they give you a grocery list, this, this is not the 67th book of the Bible. <laughs> There's probably more than five in this kind of thing, but I want to say that there are five core choices that you have to make. And if you don't make these choices, what will happen? You'll be driven by the moment and the circumstances and the emotions and you'll find yourself in a very unhealthy place. The very first choice that you have to make when discouragement comes knocking on our door, trespassing our domain, upsetting the trajectory of our lives, the first choice that I need to make is that I must choose truth. I have to choose truth. Not, not what I feel should be true, but what is objectively true? Now, let me, let me just say this to you. When I say choose truth, I mean tr truth in two ways. Number one, I, I, obviously the truth of the situation. 
I have to learn to force myself to stand back okay, and say, Crawford, you don't like what's happened. You're angry, you're frustrated, you're upset about this. In fact, you're losing a little bit of hope on this thing. Stand back and let's analyze. Let's, 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 what, what really did happen? And sometimes you have to sleep on it before you respond. So I mean that, but I mean something more. More specifically, I mean choose the truth of God's word over how I feel. Now, I'm going to say something here. One of the problems that we have as Christians in our society and our culture is that uh, the Bible has become a point of reference rather than the context of our lives. And so we keep making these forays back to the scriptures. Back when we get between a rock and a hard place, we pick and choose an a la carte truth where you have to make a decision, you have to make a decision that the Bible, God's word is, hear me, hear me, hear me, is your life. You have to decide that, that this is going to be the governor of my entire life. So we choose truth. Well, how does that relate to my discouragement? Well, the, the Bible gives us hope. Psalm 119 verse 50 says, this is my comfort and my affliction that your promise gives me life. It gives me life. We have to rein in our feelings and our thoughts and open this book and read what it says. You heard Pastor Louis a few moments ago. When he talks about going to the rock that's high and high, what did that do? It pulled him back up. It gives you hope. But the Bible also, now this is going to be, you've got to choose the Bible to be your delight. You say, okay, now what, what, what do you mean, Crawford? Can you choose an emotion? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's like I have chosen Karen to be my only wife and to be my source of joy, to be my delight. So it is with the scriptures. Psalm 1, you know what it says, that the preamble or the preface to the anthology of worship and praise known as the Psalms, the psalmist begins by saying, you need to make some decisions. He says, blessed is a man who does not, who does not, who does not, who does not, making choices in terms of what he's not going to do. Then verse 2 contrasts, well, what does he do? But his delight. There's an ellipsis there. He chooses delight. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. He says to his emotion and to his circumstances that I choose to let God's word calibrate my feelings and my thinking. So I choose that. I choose that. Uh, in the words of D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, uh, you need to talk to yourself more than you listen to yourself. Particularly when Discouragement trespasses your domain. So what do you do when you're discouraged? Well, the first thing is that, uh, Crawford, you better make some decisions here or else you're going to be in a fetal position. You're going to be cratered. So the first thing I have to do is I've got to, I've got to go vertical and objective, and I have to choose truth. Truth of circumstances and the truth of God's word. But the second thing that I have to do, and you're going to think I've lost my ever-loving mind, the second thing that I have to do is that I have to choose joy. Choose joy. Now, some of you are looking at me strange. You're saying, well, how do you choose an involuntary response? Well, easy. In Philippians chapter 4, this is, a, this is an amazing text. Philippians chapter 4, the apostle Paul says, now notice, this is an imperative it is a command. It's not prefaced by how you feel about it, but it's a command. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, you, you have to know the context. You know where, he, where he's writing this from? You know where he's writing this from, right? He's in jail. And history tells us it's not going to turn out well for him. In fact, he, he will be decapitated. He's, he's going to die. And he's in, he's in prison. And not only that, there are those who have kind of like manipulated and pimped his, his ministry platform and all this other kind of stuff. You read that over in chapter 1. And then all of this. And yet he says, rejoice in the Lord. And again I say, Rejoice. Uh, let, me, let me just make this a few observations here. Uh, 
Our joy and rejoicing have to be independent of our circumstances. Our joy and rejoicing has to be independent of our circumstances because joy is lodged in tied to that which cannot be affected. Did you hear what I just said? Joy, real soul enriching, overflowing joy is anchored in that which cannot be affected. Now, Paul was not some little novice here and he wasn't just speaking in these kind of like, you know, uh, overflowing, exaggerated, feel-good statements to this church. I happen to believe that he may have in mind uh, how this church in Philippi got started. Back over in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, um, Paul and Silas went to Macedonia and helped the, and they planted the church at Philippi, but you know what happened to them there? When they get, the, get there, they got the snot beat out of them. You know, you read these stories in the Bible and you, you think that maybe they just got roughed up a little bit, but they, they got beaten and thrown in jail. There were probably lacerations, contusions, you know, broken nose and whatever. And I can imagine Silas is saying to Paul while in jail, say, oh, hold, hold up, man, I didn't, I didn't sign up for this. I thought we were doing a little summer missionary trip, you know, we preached the gospel a little bit, then we kind of like check out the nice food places here in Macedonia and see the sights and this sort of thing. I didn't sign up for this. You would think that they'd be over in the corner just saying, God, this is not fair, we're representing you and here we get beat halfway to death and we're in jail and we don't know what's gonna happen. You know what they were doing? <laughs> they were in the corner singing and praying. Why? Because the joy was tied to that which could never be affected. You can weep over bad circumstances and yet be joyful. Because you ultimately know, know that as in Romans 8, no one or nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so you gotta choose joy. Too many of us are procrastinating our joy until our circumstances change. And by the way, when you do that, hear me on this, I don't mean to be blaming the victim, but when you do that, you commit idolatry. For you have just elevated your circumstances to determine your outlook. God determines how we look at things. And again, grieving is important. We've been through that. Sadness does not, is not the opposite of joy. We can be sad. We can be upset about things. But ultimately, we understand who is in charge. Thus, joy is a determination. We determine ourselves to be joyful. So what do you do? What do you do? What do you do when uh, discouragement comes and the wind has gotten knocked out of you? You got some horrible news. And this ain't good. Stuff, or, stuff is rapidly headed toward the south side. Well, Crawford, you better make some decisions or else you're gonna look like your circumstances. So the very first thing I have to do, I've gotta decide, I've gotta choose truth. Secondly, I've gotta choose, choose joy. But thirdly, I, I have to choose faith. I have to choose faith. Now, as you read through Hebrews chapter 11, those biographical snapshots of, eight, of those great men and women of God, what, you'll, what, you, what you will see is that their, their faith defied their circumstances. By the way, for the sake of time, let me just bottom line this and say, look, look, faith in the Bible is never denial. Never, ever, ever, ever denial. Faith in the Bible is never, in, in other words, uh, you know, uh, I hear people saying stuff like, I mean, they got a fever 105 degrees because I'm not claiming that. I'm not receiving it. I'm not claiming it. That's stupid. You got a fever 105. I don't care what you claim or don't claim. <laughs> Wait, what are you talking about? I'm not claiming that I don't have a job. Well, they ain't paying you, so what is what's up? <laughs> so... You know, I mean, you see how stupid we get. I mean, you know, it's foolishness. Faith in the Bible does not deny the reality of bad stuff. Did you hear me? It does not re deny the reality of bad stuff. It doesn't, it, but it defies it. It doesn't deny it, it defies it. 
It looks through it to see the God who's greater than and sees that this is not the ultimate reality. Thus, the writer of Hebrews says that faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. It defies things. It keeps its vision on someone that is greater. It doesn't deny the, 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 the reality of pain. And so there is this, this defiance. But also, also in the Bible, and by the way, down in verse six of Hebrews 11, without faith it is impossible to please God. And the only way to develop faith is to embrace opposition. Did you hear what I said? It's the only way you're going to develop faith. Your faith is theoretical if you don't have that which is coming against you. Now, faith is defiance, but also faith in the Bible is desperation. But desperation in the Bible is not the same thing as despair. Despair is hopelessness. Desperation in the Bible has to do with a passionate pursuit of the person of Jesus, getting to Jesus, getting to him. Often, often, often we turn to God when our foundations are shaking only to discover it's God who's shaking them. God will send disappointment. He will allow discouragement to take place. He'll allow things to unravel in our lives in order for us to develop an appetite for the presence of the Ancient of Days. It's a refining thing. It, it makes us desperate. The bad news should drive us to Jesus. There's a story in Luke chapter 8. You know the story well. Of the woman who has this issue of blood. She's hemorrhaging basically for 12 years. And uh, this is during, if, if my chronology is correct, uh, this is during the first half of our Lord's earthly ministry where the groupies are still going with him, okay? You got all these crowds and they want Jesus to do a little something for them. And so the, the scene is that there's this, you know, these crowds are, are, are surrounding Jesus. They see Jesus and his entourage, his disciples coming down the road. And so I don't know how many, there are hundreds of them are there and everybody wants a piece of Jesus. They want to do something or whatever. This woman with an issue of blood, however, she cannot be seen. She doesn't want to be recognized, which probably is the backstory here. This is the reason why she says, if I can just touch the fringe of his garment. Because according to the Levitical code, she was unclean. She was not pure. But she had spent everything she had. She says, I, I got to get to Jesus. So here, here you see this woman, she's probably, I don't know, I don't want to be unnecessarily dramatic here, but she's probably, her head's covered, she's down, slinking through the crowd, and she comes up, she says, if I can just, just get close to Jesus, touches his garment. And then Jesus asks the question, uh, who, who touched me? I think this is one of the most humorous scenes in the Bible. Because, you know, Peter says, um, um, there have been a lot of people <laughs> rubbing up against you. And Jesus says in so many words, no, 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 no. They handled me. Somebody touched me. You only touch Jesus when you're desperate. So many Christians are handling him and that's the reason why they're not getting the answers that they want. Jesus has become a cultural icon rather than the living resurrected savior. Apart from him, we can do absolutely categorically nothing. We've got to get to Jesus. Bad news, all of this stuff is a call to commune with the savior and that's faith. Faith is defiance, but faith is desperation. So what do you do when discouragement comes knocking on your door, trespassing your domain? You weren't expecting that. That ain't on my list of stuff that I wanted to see happen today, but it's there. Well, you better make some decisions or else your circumstances are gonna brand you and put you in a bad spot. So you choose truth. You choose joy, that which cannot be affected. You choose faith, but number four, you choose community. You choose, you choose community. Now, 
Listen, um, we all have different personalities. And I'm going to say something. I'm probably too much information about me, but uh, I'm going to say something about myself. People think because I speak a lot, I'm in front of people a lot, that, uh, that I'm an extrovert. Well, I'm not. I, I am an introvert that loves people. There's a spectrum there. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm an introvert that loves people. I love hanging with people and this kind of thing, but I don't get my energy from people. Uh, when I travel and speak, I don't need the key to the city. You don't have to take me on a tour. Just put me in a place. They ain't got too many roaches and, and uh, you know, <laughs> tell me where I need to be. And I'm cool. Just give a good book and tell me what I need to do. The downside of introverts, hear me on this, is that sometimes, however, when, when, when uh, I get discouraged or there's a cloud or something bad happens, I will tend to keep my counsel a little bit too long. And you gotta be careful about that. We're called to community. The late Chuck Colson said, a person cannot have God as his father without having the church as his mother. Meaning, meaning that the moment you said yes to Jesus, yes, you were connected to him, but you're placed in community. And you cannot, I'll use a 10 cent word here, you cannot experience sanctification apart from community. You can't do it. God has no lone wolf Christians. And if you're by yourself, <laughs> When you're by yourself over the long haul, nothing good happens. You get into distorted thinking. And that's why we need one another. Thus, over in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We need each other. We need to humble ourselves. And by the way, bad news is a call to humility. We need to acknowledge that no, we don't always have it all together. You don't have all the answers. You're not the fourth member of the Trinity. You're not that competent. And I, I wish we would stop, stop believing that nonsense. That we need our brothers and sisters. There are times in which we need a safe place to weep and to cry and to say how bad we feel and get it out and allow them to give us perspective that's what Paul meant when he penned the words in Romans 12, 9 through 16. Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. Yeah. We need the Holy Spirit speaking through our brothers and sisters to say, okay, here's some perspective. No, this is not the end of the line. You're going to get over this thing. You are going to make it. That's that motivational speak anchored in the hope and truth of, of, God's, of God's word. So we need people. I gotta tell you, I, there have been times through all these years, I've been in ministry now for 48, 49 years, where I thank God for people that God sent to me to speak into my heart and life. And I've always kept a, a, a crew of people around me. Why? Well, because I need perspective. You need that in your heart and life. But the final one is this. When discouragement comes knocking on your door, and it will happen, the decisions that I need to make, and I need to, I, I need to choose truth, I need to choose joy, I need to choose faith, I need to choose community. But number five, I need to choose service. I need to choose service. There's something about the reality of life. Now, don't get me wrong, I need to, I need to give a little context here. Certainly when the wind is knocked out of us, there needs to be strategic retreats. I get that. And it's appropriate to pull back. Sometimes we need to get away and you need a sabbatical or you need a vacation or you need to pull. I, I get that. I get that. But there are times and seasons in all of our lives where you can't stop. Nobody's on the other end to answer the phone. There are seasons in your life where you're going through stuff that it's not appropriate at that point to tell anybody what you're going through. And yet you have to show up. You have to show up. There have been seasons in my ministry where I didn't feel like preaching. I've pulled up to the church 
and the tears are streaming down my cheeks before I walk in. Many times I found myself praying, Holy Ghost, one more time. One more time. And sometimes you find yourself there. What do you do? Psalm 126. <laughs> what a psalm. These words, verse 4. The psalmist says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. If you've ever been to Israel, the Negev is the southern portion where it's arid. And this, this is beautiful wording, poetry. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in a desert place. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. Notice the relationship between weeping and sowing, weeping and sowing, weeping and sowing, you can do this, but you, I don't feel like doing it. I know you, you don't, Crawford, but you, weeping and sowing. What, what the writer is saying is that it is during these times when you, you, you don't want to produce, you don't want to give, you feel like running away, but you have no option. Your tears become holy fertilizer that causes a bumper crop to grow. And trust me, and I want to give hope to somebody here. I look over my life. You know the most fruitful times in my life in ministry have, have not always, but more often than not, they've been times of hardness where I've, I, I just, by faith, I had to keep going. And I look back over that and I could look at God. Look at God. So who told you to quit? Who told you to quit? You see, it is the resurrected life of Jesus. Jesus living his life in and through us. That when we feel like fainting, as Paul would say, when we feel like giving up, at that moment, Jesus rises up in us. He says, you can take another step. The very one who said, I've come that you might have life and might have it more abundantly. And if you're not a follower of the Lord Jesus and you're listening to me right now, now is the time. And maybe he's using some circumstances in your life to show you where the source of life really is. You can turn to him and trust him. There's an old line that I, I heard someone say several years ago that's really true. When you're born, you look like your parents. But when you die, you look like your choices. What are we choosing and who are we choosing to look like? 